Okay, I'm going to uh, um, tell you a, what amounts to be a, a short story, but, um, and it began when I um, joined Merck Research Laboratories. Previous to that, I had worked on um, how steroid hormones work at the molecular level, and um, obviously estrogen and testosterone are most important sex steroids. And my first day at um, Merck, I was sat down with the president and he said to me, okay, now you're here, figure out what you want to do, but you can't work on steroid hormone action. So it was a challenge, but it was a great opportunity because otherwise I would not have really got into the uh, aging field. And what I was fascinated by was the fact that as we get older, our hormone levels continue to decline. And if you reverse, um, if you just administer um, the missing hormones, to me that seemed like a very uh, primitive way to treat the disorder. And, and the idea was, well, since hormones are released in pulses and those pulses get smaller, what is it that, um, what is it that um, can control the amplitude of those pulses? And I focused on growth hormone, as I'll show you in a moment. So this is um, just um, to acknowledge uh, folks in my laboratory that did um, much of this work. And um, since it's getting late, I won't go through um, in, in great detail. So the, um, what we want to do is to target the underlying cause of aging. And, um, you know, we've heard about, um, you know, stem cells, of course, which are, are, are so important and uh, of course, um, telomere shortening. But it seemed to us that if we could um, understand the physiology behind the aging phenotype, then perhaps we could um, restore um, a, young, a young phenotype in older individuals. And we wanted to do this not because we want people to live longer, but we want them to um, live healthy lives and extend actually health span. So as you can see here that what normally happens is that around about the age of 35, we start um, falling apart gradually. And um, ideally what you'd like to do is to delay that until you're about 95 and then maybe, you know, die at 96. So that you don't have, you know, you don't wind up being in a, a nursing home for 20 years. I think that's um, what we were really setting out to try to do. So um, we identified, I'm just going to be a summary of what I'm going to be talking about, a small molecule that reversed aging of the growth hormone axis in a physiological way, and I'll show you um, some of the benefits of that, and this was um, experiments that were done in humans. And then uh, Having done that, and this was quite a challenge because we didn't understand what hormone was involved, we didn't know which receptor was involved, so we set out to really understand the physiology, and in this case, of the regulation of the amplitude of growth hormone release. And that sort of led us, once we had identified the receptor, to see where this receptor was expressed, and as I'll tell you, I'll show you, that this then led us to um, ext extend the value of these types of molecules um, to treat um, age-related memory loss and um, Alzheimer's disease. So here's the, um, the functional decline that we observe, and, and it begins at age 35, you know, and any cardiologist will tell you that. And I think from personal, um, uh, personal experience, if you reach the age of 35 and you don't um, reduce your caloric intake or exercise more, all your calories, you know, many of the calories then go into fat rather than muscle. So there's this major metabolic change that occurs and it's, it's gradual. And the basis behind this talk actually is that once we develop this compound, um, potentially I thought this would be a vitamin that you would take when you were age 35. Obviously, you can't do clinical studies to determine whether someone um, is really fit when they're 80 years old as they were when they were 40, but you can look at effects on um, 
frailty and what effects it might have on frail individuals, which is what you have to do really to um, generate um, approval for the FDA. So what happens then as aging, and I'm, as, as you can tell, I have a strong background in endocrinology, and, um, and I, although I began my career as an organic chemist, so decline in growth hormone um, release occurs, and we see this decline in sex steroid production, um, androgens in men, estrogen in women, and what's interesting about that is we've heard about um, the inflammatory, um, inflammatory basis of aging and so on, and pro-inflammatory cytokines. Well, the natural antagonists of pro-inflammatory cytokines and um, stress and so on are the sex steroids and, and growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor that affects metabolism. And it's no surprise that if our sex steroids are, are falling, and our growth hormone is falling, that we're more susceptible to inflammation and the um, bad side of inflammation. So you could argue that the good hormones are declining and the bad hormones are increasing. And relatively, of course, cortisol also increases, and we're much more susceptible to stress. And so why is um, maintaining a growth hormone level, a youthful growth hormone level important? Well, as you can see on this slide, it affects um, many tissues. It's not just affecting growth. It affects our brains. It's, um, we see um, in animals when you damage neurons, the growth hormone then travels up the pituitary stalk into the brain to the site of damage to help repair. Um, very important in terms of immune function, has a positive benefit on, on the thymus, uh, liver, and of course, with um, metabolism, with channeling um, calories into, into muscle rather than fat. So here's a profile of what happens to our growth hormone as we get older. Now, I had no interest in um, growth hormone treatment, giving individuals a slug of growth hormone to make up for this change in amplitude of growth hormone release. But what you can see is you still get these pulses approximately every three hours as you get older, but the amplitude of those pulses gets smaller and smaller. So the idea was, well, what if we, had a, we could um, enhance or, if you like, um, reverse the phenotype in terms of the growth hormone profile from the old to the young so that we mimic normal physiology in an old person um, and in that, if we could do that, would that have any, uh, any, any health benefit? Because, you know, obviously you say, well, okay, you can reverse it, but so what? You know, if it doesn't help, then there's no point in doing it. So anyway, we uh, discovered, let me see, let's, okay. So this is what would happen if you just gave a growth hormone injection. And you, what you can see is you've got this huge peak of growth hormone and you can get one injection that would last a week or once a day, um, um, you would get this type of profile. But as you can see, it doesn't mimic physiology at all. And when these studies were done with high level growth hormone replacement in elderly individuals, they got increased skin thickness, you know, they looked as if everything was working out well, and then the men started developing breasts, gynecomastia, and um, carpal tunnel syndrome. So there are major side effects of, um, so even though the um, skin thickness and muscle and tone was that of a, um, someone many years younger, and this was uh, you know, reported in um, the New England Journal of Medicine, there was a lot of uh, appeal for this because this was the anti-aging hormone. But of course, as I said, there were these side effects. So what we did, we developed a small molecule that was able to correct that amplitude of growth hormone release. And this is one example of what happens on, um, in a group of frail elderly subjects that were treated with a pill once a day for 12 months. And there was this um, modest improvement in strength at knee and shoulder initially. And, but the important thing is that the placebo group continued to lose strength over that 12-month period. 
So to me, this was very exciting because it meant that you could um, potentially keep people out of nursing homes. Now, when I presented this data to the marketing group at Merck, and this is the unfortunate thing, they said, well, um, but age, aging is, you know, the FDA doesn't really recognize aging as a disease. And why would we, you know, what's the point of being independent and keeping people out of nursing homes? Because the FDA wants a clinical endpoint, which, you know, I would argue is a, is a clinical endpoint. So here's um, um, just a cartoon of what we were able to accomplish. So as our as we get older, our brain just sort of shrinks. We lose connections, not necessarily neurons, but we lose those connections. And it becomes very, very sluggish. It's not working well at all. And in fact, that's why um, the growth hormone release declines, because our pituitary gland makes almost as much growth hormone, but it's the signal from the brain to the pituitary gland that becomes dampened with age. And we were able to fix that with a, with a small molecule. So we um, developed this pill called, um, it was named MK677. And this is the data we obtained um, in, in the human studies. So as you can see that it, and I mentioned in before, that it inhibits the adverse metabolic changes. So now you are um, pushing calories back into muscle where they belong. Um, modestly improves strength, as I've shown you. Um, accelerates recovery from hip fracture. There was a 20% increase in the number of individuals over 70 that returned to independent living within six months. And many individuals um, over 70 die at the end of 12 months. Um, a different com this compound and a different compound that I developed when I founded a, a small company inhibits weight loss associated with cancer and cancer chemotherapy. And two phase three pivotal trials have just been completed on that, showing in fact that um, these individuals um, gain weight. And the issue that's outstanding right now with the FDA is that even though they, were, they looked better, they gain weight, that they didn't have improved grip strength. So many of those studies are being repeated now. And anecdotally um, improved mood and libido, which is not less surprising if these individuals felt better. Now, once we had um, cloned the receptor, and all the data I showed you there was from humans, we then asked the question, um, where is this, um, where is this um, receptor expressed that um, responds to this small molecule? And it's a small molecule, molecular weight 500. And what was intriguing to me, and this is what drove me to take early retirement from Merck, is that it's present in parts of the brain in the hippocampal structures that are involved in memory and learning. And my idea was, well, if we could um, target this in the brain, it's one thing to develop, to, to um, reverse aging and get um, important aspects of um, physical functions to return or be maintained. But, you know, what I'm more concerned about is what happens in, in our brain. And unless my brain continues to function, I won't be able to do research any longer. So, um, so these are the areas of the brain that um, this receptor is expressed. So then, we then, after I left Merck, we began to explore new avenues. And that was to look at the uh, significance of the expression of this in the brain. Um, and we understood now how the um, compounds worked, and we understood some of the aspects of the aging brain, what goes on. There are certain bad enzymes that are activated in the brain during, the, um, during aging that are involved, actually, not only in age-related memory loss, but also in susceptibility to Alzheimer's disease. And these compounds would inhibit activity of that enzyme. And what's most important is because they act through a receptor in the hippocampal structures that control, which is where you lose neurons as you get old, well, connections as you get older, but neurons in Alzheimer's disease, we felt that this might be a good target um, to test to see whether or not we could prevent age-related memory loss. So um, 
MK677 itself, the one that I showed you all the data on, physical data, did not penetrate the brain well. So we sought a compound that penetrates the brain much better and gets into the deep regions of the brain that are involved in memory and learning. Now I'm just gonna show you a couple of slides on, because we have to test these compounds to determine whether or not they have any effects on memory at all. And we use um, rodents for these studies and usually mice. So this is a Morris water maze. And the idea here is that you put the uh, mouse in the water and it has to find a hidden platform. And it, there are, are um, markers around the room so that it's a test of spatial memory. So here's the, uh, the, the objective then is to teach the animals how to, to find, or how long does it take for them to find the hidden platform? And once they find it, can they remember it a week later? So this is a typical um, mouse. So before learning, it just swims around, don't know where the hell it's going, and then you just pick it up, put it on the platform, and then gradually the mouse will learn because you don't let it um, stay from... Yeah, has to find it within 60 seconds. So this is a typical um, training assay. So you can see that at the beginning here, on the far left, upper left, that the um, mouse is, you know, searching for the platform. But then by day six, it goes straight to it. So it's learned. And it can remember a, a week later. So here's some real data now um, from such a study. Now, this is in um, an um, aging mouse, and this is a 14-month-old mouse, which is old for a mouse, and I would say that's probably about um, 60 years old for a, a, a human. And what you can see here is that um, it reaches this threshold of finding the platform within 20 seconds. When it's treated with two different doses of this drug that activates the same receptor as MK677, but penetrates the brain. So this is an example of reversing age-related memory loss, which many of us um, suffer from. We then did another test, which with individuals with Alzheimer's disease often can't remember where they are and they can't find their house and so on. So here's an experiment where you put the mouse in the cage, you let it look around, um, identify its environment, and then you give a foot shock. Very brief foot shock. And it, of course it freezes. Then you take it out, put it in its home cage, then put it back into the, um, this cage again, and it automatically associates its surroundings with a foot shock, and it will freeze. If, if, it, re you know, if it remembers. I'm not going to show that. So here's an example of... Um, one week, uh, 24 hours, um, and then one month later, and we have data now on two months later. And what you can see, and this actually is in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. So these mice will, if they're allowed to, if you don't treat them, they'll form plaques and tangles. And, and we'd already know that these molecules, which we did experiments in, in um, cell culture, will modify the processing of the protein that leads to the amyloid plaques. And the rascal there is the A beta, as it's called, A beta 40 and 42. Um, what these compounds will do is that they will alter that so that instead of making the um, beta amyloid that forms the plaques, they will, make, um, they will activate a different enzyme called alpha secretase that um, is neuroprotective. So it was no surprise to us that we were able to show that in the control animals, the ones that were not treated, as you can see, they didn't freeze um, after one month. Only about 20% of them were freezing compared to those that were treated with the drug. So these were litimate animals, both of them with um, Alzheimer's, if you like, or the, um, the gene that could causes Alzheimer's disease, but that we were able to show with this compound that we were able to prevent the memory loss associated um, and progression, actually, of the, of the disease. Um, this is another ex uh, example of the Alzheimer's mice, so the non-treated versus the drug-treated mice. And you can see that there's a clear, a clear difference that the, these animals forget after a month 
and, and now we, as I say, we have data out to three months. So very briefly then, that the aging and Alzheimer's disease um, results show that, um, that if you don't treat these animals, the old animals have impaired um, spatial memory, impaired contextual memory with age, that's accelerated in the Alzheimer's mouse, but both of these can be blocked by administration of this com compound. So in conclusion, I've showed you that um, the MK677, the first compound that I discovered when I was at Merck, indeed can prevent these changes in physical function. We also showed that it had um, be positive benefits on immune function um, and has anti-inflammatory properties. But as I say, that it doesn't get into deep regions of the brain. So we needed a new molecule that acts on the same receptor to treat test the concept that we could prevent age-related memory loss and prevent um, progression of Alzheimer's disease. And of course, everyone else has um, talked about funding. So I have to say that we're, you know, we run, do this thing on a shoestring, we're not a company. And I think that there is the potential to um, turn this into a, a, you know, an opportunity. Um, but we need a, really need additional uh, funding to be able to um, file an IND and begin to do the phase one and phase two clinical study. Actually, this compound has already answered phase one clinical study for a, um, a different indication. So we're closing my favorite um, aging woman. Um, I will leave, I'll leave you with that. But, um, Sophia Loren, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.